Hello and welcome to another installment of this video series on C star algebras from a novice perspective. And today we're going to talk about unitization. So the time has fin finally come to start talking a bit more about the theory about these Banach star algebras and C star algebras in particular. And let us remind ourselves of the roadmap for what is to come. First off, we're going to try to introduce the Gelfand theory for commutative Banach star algebras, and then we present the commutative Gelfand Nymeric theorem. We may also call it the Gelfand representation. We'll see what feels uh, best once we get there. And once we have this, we can go on to introduce the functional calculus of normal elements, and then go over the consequences this has for positive elements of a C star algebra. And once we have this, established, we can finally use this theory of positive elements to describe the GNS construction, which really lies at the heart of the non-commutative gelfand nymark theorem. And the agenda of the day is to answer the following question. What to do if A is not already a unital Banach star algebra? The answer, answer to this question is the following. We unitize it. Let's go over what that actually means. So generally speaking, as we have seen in earlier videos in some of the examples, Banach algebras do not need to be unital, but there is always a way to embed any non-unital Banach algebra into a unital Banach algebra, which we denote by this tilde over A. And this is done as follows. First, we let A tilde simply be the direct sum of A and the complex numbers. So this can be seen as adding a, a dimension of scalars to A so that this A tilde now consists of both a scalar part and a non-scalar part. And the unit is going to lie in this scalar part in the end. And then we define multiplication, involution and norm on this A tilde in the following way. First we have the multiplication which is this thing here. And as we can see, it's very similar to cross multiplication. So we just take every term multiplied by another term in what, whatever way you can do multiplication here. And then you put the non-scalar bits in the non-scalar part, and then you put the scalar bit in the scalar part. And then once we have the multiplication, we can also define the star operator or the star operator pretty simply by using the star operator on A that we already have and then adding this complex conjugate of on this uh, scalar part as well. So, so it's not really a strange star operator at all. And then the norm on this new unitization of A comma lambda is this supreme norm over here. So it's the supreme of A, B, plus lambda b, where b is any can be any element with norm less than or equal to 1. So this is an induced norm. And of course, we have that the unit is 0, 1, which is pretty easy to check as well. Now, many things are pretty obvious with this unitization. It's obvious that it has a unit. It's obvious that it's, uh, it has a star operation. And it's easy to check that the star operation is really like, uh, it's not an isometry, but, but it's going to be an involution, and it's going to be conjugate linear. So, so that's pretty easy to check. But what about the norm? Is this norm that we have actually a Banach norm? The answer to this question is yes, it is. But how do we actually prove that this norm is Banach? We do it by using operators. Let's go over how exactly. First, we note the following, that A, since it's a Banach algebra, it's also a normed vector space, implying that this induced operator norm that we have here is actually a Banach norm. So it has this submultiplicative uh, property. And this is something we saw in the last video non, for non-examples, for instance. So this is true for any Banach algebra no matter what. And then we take for each a comma lambda in a tilde, we'll let f sub a tilde 
or f sub a lambda acting on b be a times b plus lambda b. Then this f is of course going to be a bounded linear operator on a. And then also we note that f sub a lambda times b mu is the same as f sub a lambda times f sub b mu. And finally, we note this particular identity here, which is very important, that the norm of a lambda in a tilde is equal to the operator norm of f sub a lambda. And then we can simply use this fact to prove what we want. Basically, that the norm of this product of a lambda times b mu is equal to the operator norm of these operators here, f a sub, sub a lambda and f sub b mu. And since this is a, a Banach norm, we ha have the submultiplicative property here. So this is less than or equal to the, this product of operator norms. But these operators norms are just equal to this right here. So we have this identity here, which falls pretty easily once we apply this sort of operator theory mindset. Now, this holds for any Banach star algebra, but what about Caesar algebras? Are there any more things we can prove when we have even more structure? So what are the Caesar properties? Well, the first easy one is that if A is a Caesar algebra, then this natural embedding of A into A tilde, which maps A to A comma zero, is an isometry. And this is due to the Caesar property. So the, the norm of an element a in the algebra that we began with is equal to this particular expression here. So it's equal to the norm of a times the star of a divided by the norm of a. And this is because of the c star property that the norm of a squared is equal to the norm of a times a star. And therefore, when we have this only the norm of a, then we have to divide by the norm of a over here. And by definition, this is, of course, less than or equal to the norm of a comma zero in the unitization. And this is because this element here we chose is an element with norm one. And now this is, of course, just equal to this particular supremum over all b with norm less than or equal to one. But this is just by the submultiplicative property of the norm on A, it's just less than or equal to the norm of A. So it's really an isometry, it's not very hard to prove, but you have to use the C star property to get this particular equality in the beginning here. Also easy to check is that A is a maximal ideal of a tilde of co-dimension one, since this quotient here is just the set of complex numbers by construction. So that is really almost trivial as, as a consequence. But slightly less trivial is the following statement. That is, if A is a Caesar algebra, then so is its unitization. And let's go over how the proof of this is, because this is not something fancy, it's just brute force calculation in so we do it like this. And here we take the norm of a comma lambda squared. And by definition, it's equal to this supremum here. But this norm here is the a norm in a, the algebra that we be, began with. So by assumption, this is a C star norm. So we use the C star property, which implies that this norm squared is just equal to the norm of the what's inside times its own conjugate. So we, we get by the C star property that it's this supremum over here in the second line right here. We get this identity by the C star property. But now we note that B star is in front here in every element. So we can use the submultiplicative property of the norm here, because it's a Banach norm, to get this inequality right here. So we take away the norm of B star, which is also going to be less than or equal to one if the norm of B 
is less than or equal to 1. And this has to do with the fact that since it's a C star norm, then this, this involution is going to be an isometry as well. So then we have that this inequality holds, and we are getting here. But this norm right here is just equal to the norm of this particular element in A tilde. And this particular element in A tilde is just equal to this product of A comma lambda star times A comma lambda, which is by the submultiplicative property less than or equal to the norm of A lambda star times the norm of A lambda, like this. And thus we get that the norm of a comma lambda is less than or equal to the norm of a comma lambda star, which can be seen here. We have a comma lambda star times a the norm of a lambda, and here we have in the beginning we have the norm of a comma lambda squared. So by symmetry, of course, we have that the norm of a comma lambda must be equal to the norm of a comma lambda star. Because we can use this, this exact argument again to prove that the norm of a comma lambda star is less than or equal to the, the norm of a comma lambda. And this implies that the following is true. So a comma lambda square, squared, if we take this norm of a comma lambda squared, this is less than or equal to this norm of a comma lambda star times a comma lambda which is less than or equal to this by the submultiplicative property of the norm. And this is just equal to the norm of a comma lambda squared. So we see that we have sort of squeezed in this element over here between two expressions which are equal. So therefore we get that the C star property is satisfied. And we have a C star norm and as a result, the unitization is a C star algebra. Now, let's go over some sort of conceptualization of this unitization. What does it mean more geometrically? And it's actually good to check one particular example, and that is something we've seen before. That of a locally compact house door space X that is not compact. Then, as we have seen before, this C star algebra C naught of x is non-unital and it's commutative as well. But then the obvious question is, what is the unitization of this particular algebra? The answer is that it's isomorphic to C naught of x tilde, where x tilde is the one point compactification of x. And this is pretty uh, how to put it, uh, expected, if you think in the following way. So I like to think of things when it comes to algebras uh, versus uh, topological spaces in the following sense. So one dimension in this function algebra over X can be seen as sort of correspond to one point in the space X itself. And to me, I, I always find this to be a helpful sort of analogy to put in some sort of conceptual dictionary of sorts. And with this, we are almost finished, but I actually want to go over one final detail about the unitization that many people seem to sort of not consider at first glance, and that is the following. What if the Bach algebra we started with is already unital? What happens if we try to unitize it with this exact procedure we did before? Well, then we have some issues with this norm that we had on A tilde. In particular, we have the following problem, that if we take the norm of this particular element, that is one, the unit of A, and comma, minus one, then this is by definition equal to this supremum over here. But this is just equal to zero. No matter what b we put in here, it's going to be zero. But that is a problem because then every element of this particular form here 
has a norm zero, even though there are many non-zero elements that have this form. So what does this actually mean? Well, for our purposes, it means that we're going to sweep it under the rug by never even considering this kind of scenario. We're only going to try to unitize non-unital Banach star algebras. But in general, this issue can be resolved. Uh, and with that, let's go over to the recap of this short lecture. So first off, any non-unital Banach star algebra can be unitized by adding a scalar dimension to the algebra. And when we do this, if our original algebra A is a Caesar algebra, then so is the unitization A tilde. Moreover, this canonical embedding of A into A tilde is an isometric embedding. And finally, in what follows, we're only going to consider the unitization of non-unital Banach algebras, although it is possible to unitize unital Banach algebras as well. And I'm actually going to link um, an interesting discussion or an interesting thread in math overflow for those who are interested in learning more about this issue and how you actually deal with it. But for now, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And the next time I think I will talk about spectrum of uh, Banach algebras in general. So we get some sort of general gr ground to stand on. But for now, see you later.